Hello everyone, today we talk about the late Roman army in the migration era, reflecting on a couple of aspects that are usually, you know, debated and portrayed in, in, say, in different ways, at least from different perspectives often, that have to do fundamentally with the effectiveness of the late Roman military and essentially the reason of the apparent failure in, in the face of the invasions and how fundamentally the thing did go downhill. So we actually made a lot of videos about the late antiquity, broadly meant, and we have already highlighted, you know, basically all of these points and sometimes even discussed them in some, in some depth. So today it's really just a, a broader reflection on certain historiographical mm, keys of interpretation, we could say, to actually substantiate what this this matter really ro was about, right? You know, the, the, there are people who see, for example, a very marked uh, contrast between the the mm, weight, we could say, literally, from, think about tax pressure, etc., um, on of the military apparatus in, in late Roman times, and the exiguity of its performance. So, this conception is, um, you know, already mm, uh, criticizable in this sense. You know, we, we, okay, uh, there is no doubt that the Roman army, essentially by the beginning of the 4th century, this is something that was started to be, mm, you know, fully functional, we could say even since the time of, of Diocletian, actually, so even before, um, as a consequence of the 3rd century crisis, that even in there was triggered fundamentally by more than nails, I would say, then, this is also what Ether believes, um, by the renewed uh, Persian uh, expansionism that was built by the Sassanids on very and uh, different, much more solid, by the way, basis than what the Arsacids uh, had, had managed. Uh, and that brought the Romans essentially to increase um, the uh, military uh, in its numbers of uh, there is a, a wild debate about this, but fundamentally from let's say three hundred thousand to four hundred thousand, roughly. So uh, essentially one third, thirty three uh, percent, which was an enormous cost for a for for, for a society of, of that time, right? Yeah, for a community of that time that surely had a, a, an impressive military for those time beings, but still with you know a productivity. Um, that so that of course we witnessed this increase and we, we treated as if you know before the Roman army was less militarized, but as we know it was not really like that. You know the the Roman military constituted the the greatest uh, expense for the state, but it was also its most effective component right throughout all uh, Roman history. But this massive increase uh, was in fact operating on on a you know, relatively precarious base for, for a world, um, such a primitive one, like a pre-industrial one, that uh, the, the crop rates of which were dramatically low, where growth was not even conceived um, in, in, the, in the ways we do today, right? Today, it's, it's a tragedy if we don't get those points percentage in the GDP. At the time, the world seemed like, you know, a still thing that was, was always there, more or less went on with the same rhythms. So there was this gigantic effort actually to change, literally, the, the vision of the empire. The third century crisis had surely uh, accelerated this process, had obviously rendered evident the necessities of an increased defense, and um, this mm, uh, required definitely uh, a political and social restructuring that, however, was going on, basically, in, in its own way, with all the invasions, the raids, the civil wars, especially, that had ravaged the empire. Um, debatably, also, you know, a, a worsened uh, environmental situation, but we, we can't really say whether it was a climate problem. Uh, quite likely it wasn't, or at least, you know, it just accelerated me, a process that was already going on. And other trends that are more difficult to track because we, we literally don't know. We, we don't have this dramatic evidence uh, from a historical and archaeological point of view. There are very few things we can't properly ascertain, right? But definitely the renewed 
Persian expansionism brought Rome to strengthen dramatically its defenses. Uh, not just actually on the eastern frontier, that was the also the the, the more defenseless one in the sense that um, the the connections between Syria, Mesopotamia, etc., where the struggle was taking place, Armenia was more mo mountainous, so it was a bit of a situation, but, you know, were fundamentally fought uh, in the open, right? The Roman army in all this maintained the upper hand, right? The the military correspondence, um, let's say the doctrinal correspondence uh, to this increase in the military was essentially the, Cos the Constantinian uh, army that was, uh, I think, by no undoubtedly the, the single most efficient Roman arm we've ever had. The, from a tactical point of view, was the, the more effective. Uh, we know it had a dramatically increased defensive and offensive potential. Uh, it kept at bay enemies such as the Alamanni and the Sassanids that were basically the greatest threat, tactically speaking, the, the Romans had ever faced. Um, and this is something that really must be observed in perspective by not by being very objective about what 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 threats we were, we were facing. Now, today we will talk in part also of what the, the Germans had become, right? But if you look at previous times, um, at the Roman frontiers, uh, there, there wasn't fundamentally any threat, right? Even the late Roman times, any serious threat, I mean, small raids are something that happens everywhere. So there's brigand age as well, uh, can be internal revolts. Uh, what we see, for example, as the, the, the military capabilities, as the Parthians were fairly ridiculous, right? They never give up the idea that, you know, they, they would um, fundamentally recover the Near East from the Romans, but they failed clamorously, and part of the reason why the Sassanids raced to power is that the Romans destroyed Parthia twice. Um, and um, so also these major iconic defeats, such as Karai, or if you think of uh, in Central Europe, if you take, uh, I don't know, the Battle of the Sirtabur Forest, etc. Uh, these things have been dramatized, not just by, you know, at the time, for specific political reasons, not the, that these battles were not important, as some other people extremize as well, but also, you know, uh, absolutely, you know, the, 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 the narrative which this is told usually is uh, is very ideological, sometimes also very disturbing ac accordingly, right? Um, and let's say that for for hundred or, uh, hundreds of years, the people who lived at at the frontier with with with, Ro with Rome didn't constitute a, a real threat, right, of any kind, right? They were t either too poor or too politically fragmented, and also in the late Roman times, at the time the so-called invasions, the invasions were as well as migrations at the same time, um, let's say um, there was still a complicity, right? There was still a an idea that uh, a universal empire fundamentally did rule all over these peoples, even beyond the frontiers. The Roman Empire didn't actually have frontiers properly. They didn't have borders, say better as we usually say. The Romans didn't even use the term limes as we use it today. As most, as most Roman... Uh, historiographical um, uh, lexicon, let's say, most stuff is literally modern age, right? We invented in the West but later on. At the time, the Romans had naturally very different ways of addressing things because simply the world was different at the time. Uh, and the army was crucial in there because the actual frontier of the empire, the actual border of the empire was the army in a sense, or better, not even. I mean, the army was so -called, the so-called munimentum, that is to say a sort of properly of, of bulwark um, that was meant to to control through the terrains, not what was, you know, outside the empire, but what was inside, chiefly, and also outside. And this basically worked, because naturally all the peoples that bordered Rome were dramatically more Romanized than, you know, they, they could ever, you know, influence their, their, you know, themselves culturally, uh, the Romans in turn. And this is valid... Basically, for every people, even in the most cultural impacting, like the Persians, etc. Um, and uh, this is considered living at the frontier of the Roman frontier. You're 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 always, um, let's say, um, exposed to Roman cultural influences. You know their politics; they interfere in yours. They 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 become threatening sometimes. So you acquire a civilization capacity because by osmosis you know you start you know compacting your 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 realities that from tribal past to be kind of you know very gradually in a kind of a 
king-oriented thing also because the Romans pay you for it um, because they need to have a specific reference there and in this society is became Roman in many ways, um, in, 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 in a way that it is also very easily tra uh, tactically traceable, right? Since the 18th century, oh, we wanted to make it, make it ideologically dramatic, saying, ah, Rome fell, it was a terrible thing, all seeing it from the interior side of the story, right? But try to think it from the exterior side of the story. Um, it, uh, for, for those peoples, uh, Rome ever hardly fell, Right. They were living within Rome, even when they were marching properly in Roman-held territory, they were fighting against the Romans. It was never about destroying Rome or the, the benefits of Roman civilization that these peoples were obsessed with you know, seizing for their own and to make them uh, to make work. But also, the, literally, the same Romans interfered with this. For example, look at the, um, the troubles with, with the Goths on the Thracian frontier. It started because, you know, the same the certain, certain Roman general want, wanted to make a coup in the same empire and starting siding with the Goths and, you know, fighting all together. It was, uh, you can imagine the hybrid of political, military, social aspects that, that all went on. Um, and aside from this, um, indeed, the Roman military increased uh, its power um, at this point. Uh, but it should be pointed out that we're talking about an empire that had different, uh, a, a different uh, situation of, of resources available, probably not so dramatically uh, different. Like the, the third century crisis uh, was was consistently a moment in which the empire could collapse. Um, and this is often overlooked, but not only, but the, the, uh, what is more striking is the Roman capacity of recovery. Even in a moment when they had lost, in fact, important, um, especially demographic resources, and, uh, but also political, civic ones, in the measure of, for example, the possibility of drawing um, fighting force from the Rome, uh, from from within the, the Roman held territory, the Romans began to hire people from from the from the outer side, and this worked in the sense that these people were were Romanized, right? The, the Roman military machine throughout all the, the Roman army was was not was hardly barbarized at this point. Um, there was never properly the barbarization of the Roman army by definition, in the sense that uh, as long as there was a Roman state. Right, and that's the thing you have to read there and understand why the state at some certain point was no more. There was a Roman army, and this was exclusively a Roman army. Right, there was nothing like the, I don't know, when we talk about the Federato, we talk in fact about other people. We don't talk about a chunk of the Roman army that was foreign. We're, we're talking always of other peoples that began to be used, as always, the Romans did as allies. Uh, with a political uh, complicity and therefore military support at some point that also at some point become difficult to be managed because the state doesn't have equal resources to, to cope either with multiple threats at once or you know internal strife because let's be honest the greatest Roman enemy were the Romans right there is no properly there is no comparison between the amount of resources the Romans uh, destroyed by fighting themselves and once they, they came to, to lose in, in face of barbarian uh, onslaught, right? There is no comparison. Um, and uh, and it's normal for a word like that, that were, you know, in pre-nation-state pre na times, you know, political coercion was ridiculous. And But at the same time, and this is the, properly the aspect, there are certain chunks of this huge thing that is never being unitary in its nature. Right, that want to be autonomous and on their own. Look at the empire of, of the Gauls. Um, that was not a secession from the Roman Empire. That was literally a chunk of the empire that started to rule itself on its own, to share its revenues within itself, and to say, okay, we we are Romans. We, in, a, in a fully Romanized reality, right? You know, if Caesar had seen what you know Gaul was, you know, half of a millennium after his conquest, say, wow, uh, this is actually, you know. Roman cities everywhere, Roman way of life, Roman education, everything, right? Working in that sense, and in a non in a non competitive sense with the empire. Very different were other uh, episodes such as I don't know um, uh, the Palmyrain offensive or others. But even in there, we have to realize that we're talking about areas where Romanization was um, was different, right? Romanization is a bit of a tricky thing because. We often assume that, you know, there where, you know, you're more advanced, civilly speaking, you are Roman. This is not completely true, or, or at least 
uh, it is true in as much as Roman uh, government is able to sustain itself in areas that are surely more developed and productive, right? And that's also the reason why the Romans at a certain point stopped, because they didn't have, in terms of cost-benefit ratio, an interest of conquering further other areas that were unproductive and, you know, underdeveloped and would have costed too much to civilize. Um, it's not really about any military prowess. The, the poorer you are, the least, uh, you know, military effective you are. This is something that we have to understand pretty clearly. There is no conspiracy theory behind the fact that the, 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 the Germans at the time of Augustus were essentially and literally a primitive people and a prehistoric people, uh, and that, the, you know, properly the Romans tested that, realized what the situation was, and after the debacle, they say, okay, you know what, you know, we have different things to, to think about. Uh, it was really an important matter of, um, you know, literally even having the means to sustain the army locally, right? It wasn't just a, much about the fact that these were politically fragmented, disunited, uh, continuously turmoilous areas, I meaning, you know, this central European population is basically... Uh, think about the massacre of the Brook Terry, right? 60,000 people exterminated among so-called Germans that even invited the Romans to see the massacre of them, you know, they were killing each other. I mean, it was a, uh, it's a hardly, you know, for a modern mindset, it's hardly even, you know, conceivable that the, the, the sheer amount of radical violence that permeated these cultures. It's something disturbing objectively for our moral and emotional standards and times. But we have to face it because that's literally what they were, right? And that's where you don't want to put hands. It's like, you know, the Americans invading Iraq and then getting out of Iraq, you know, and and it, with the situation still messed up or, you know, with, with Afghanistan at the same time. You know, it, it doesn't speak of, you know, the incapacity of, of a country like the United States to literally control everything. It simply says that, you know, at one point it, 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 it's useless, right? You, you realize that you have miscalculated something and you bail out, right? Um, it's not like 19th century nationalism said that it was some kind of national unity of these peoples that kicked out the Romans or whatever. This is absolute nonsense in an historical perspective. Uh, but even more... I would say here, what we, we underestimate is the internal situation of the empire, that is to say, um, uh, the, which is very complicated, because there weren't just different countries, literally, within the empire, but there were also different levels of development, and, and different, uh, literally, it, the empire was so big that um, even when it was threatened, there was nothing like the idea of, of any power that could uh, literally conquered the whole empire, right? You know, what did, I don't know, the Spanish have to do with what was happening in Syria, right? Aside from, yes, Mediterranean traffics that was, could, could have gone, uh, they were sure, especially the, the coastal centers, the most urbanized areas, I give you that. Yes, it was important. It would be important trade dynamics, uh, important even demographic dynamics. Think about the, uh, you know, demic supportability with grain imports and all this stuff. But, I mean, in the interland especially. Um, there was a, and that's a very important divide. The interland from from the Mediterranean coastline was was a very deep one, even in in same Italy, even even in dramatically urbanized uh, areas such as Asia Minor, um, uh, or Africa, or or Gaul, right? Um, and Spain also not a good example. The same Balkans, it's pretty evident. So um, we have to understand, I mean, in there uh, the the actual interests that mm, uh, moved these local communities and why at a certain point this empire came literally to to fall apart right in 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 a very gradual almost imperceptible way i mean in 476 ad literally nothing happened i mean but nothing it's not even a matter of saying you know Odoacer rendered the, the, the ensigns back to Constantinople and something literally changed at the moment. It, it, it cha didn't change anything. Nothing was going on, right? It's not a matter of perspective. It's literally nobody realized anything because there was nothing to realize. Um, uh, the elites, we often read history here uh, without, for I mean, forgetting the fact that we're, we're just listening to what the elites said and the elites were definitely the most involved in this in the in maintaining the, the ecumenic unity of the empire because they were exactly the most international ones, the ones who had estates scattered all over 
uh, various regions of the same empire where private uh, families that were ruling the empire needed, of course, to, to profit, um, to, to, to maintain all this stuff together. But the rest of the populations also lived different realities. And I'm not saying even here that it was this dramatic, let's say, uh, exploitational oppression, whatever. This was surely true um, when we look at uh, the, uh, the, of course, what the, the peasant, the free peasantry had been reduced, like I don't know, by already the fourth century, and or uh, the living conditions, in fact, of of, of the, in these centers. What that even in here we we tend maybe to to con to make contrast excessively what what reality was before, right? There was never kind of a moment where there was a happy. Uh, they were the average uh, inhabitant of the Roman Empire or any other empire for that matter was like a free, uh, you know, a middle class, well off uh, free man that, you know, lived relatively prosper. Uh, that's just a picture we get from the centers of culture, of, of power and wealth accumulation, such as the, the capital, the city but themselves. But overwhelmingly, the, the majority of the population lived in the countryside. And aside from the fact that we 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 rarely even know what 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 the hell was going on in there, and the Roman Latifundia, for those who worked in there, were not even that that great thing. Maybe during the later empire, things even changed slightly for the better, in a sense, uh, in terms of sheer living conditions uh, than before, where slavery was much more you know properly injected continuously. Human life was literally cheaper in that regard to exploit, um, but. Um, as always, right? There is no comparison. I don't know. In the Middle Ages, many more people, uh, by properly, by quantitatively speaking, lived in cities, right? Even if you wonder with strange comparisons, like you know, it was, was uh, medieval cities were dirty or whatever. Yes, because you know they they were dramatically more crowded than a Roman one, and part of the reason is because the Roman cities were, yes, the 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 cornerstones in which the, the empire was built, but also not literally the world picture of the, Ro the Roman world, not even the majority, right? Um, there were areas that remained under Roman control for half of a millennium and basically didn't see much of a, an actual change. Um, they're talking about places like northern Spain or, uh, or Armorgan in Br Brittany, uh, some areas of Britain. But as we were saying before, you know, look at the Balkan interland, or look at you know it, it, the the Anatolian interland. I mean, uh, it's difficult sometimes to to explain this because we live in a world that is so intertwined and globalized that it seems difficult for us to think that I don't know thirty kilometers from 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 wherever you live there is a you know a, in a, in a developed world that is a, a dramatically underdeveloped world. At the time, it was basically like that, or at least you know maybe. Uh, the the it, it was not much about a matter of, of development per se, but literally the, the kind of of world that was out there, right? Uh, today, the majority of people live in the cities, for example. So when we look at the countryside, we even see basically just an emanation of the of city economy in a sense. Uh, at the time, it was the other way around. Um, so when we talk about uh, the increase in um, you know, in military, in fiscal pressure for the support of the military and so on. Here we're talking about a system that was objectively holding in an incredible way, and this is thanks to properly Roman civilization had it had formed in a in a properly civic sense, right? Um, don't don't trust the, 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 as Clausewitzians we know that you can't enforce a military um, action. If there is n and and be successful, if there is not a successful political and social reality behind that, the Roman Empire didn't conquer the world because it had legions, or better, legions existed because there was a political and social reality that we constantly neglect. Also, f to dramatize a bit the story, so that we want to pretend that this was just about war and ferocious exploitation and imperialism, right? You know, Roman times you had finally the idea of an economic reality where you know if whoever you are if you if you're loyal to the state you can acquire a full right as the the, the world the world owners right and th th that's a concept of equality that we bring together you know roman symbolism politically is everywhere in every basically any countries uh if you look at you know symbolisms and uh, the pol politics institutions the, the, the roman empire has this um, 
incredible, uh, astonishing legacy that it, it's most obviously rooted in this idea of participation, of duty and right at the same time. Uh, and we are definitely uh, children of that world. Um, so what is striking about the boosting of Roman military uh, capacity by the, the Constantinian times, um, as it had been accomplished and perfectioned by then, um, the the capacity of the empire to hold together the fact that for throughout basically all, almost all the fourth century was no um, no major threat no major mm, you know problem of unity of, of perceived decline of crisis whatever because this system had managed to put it, itself back together on its feet but also with a different formula it surely had brought certain strains. Um, to the system, but it still held, right? And what we care about here is not that the system, uh, you know, was more or less, let's say, free than before. Because had it collapsed, it would have definitely been much worse <laughs> than before, in a sense, at that point. Because resources would have been still used to, to fight each other, as the Romans kept doing, in a way, uh, eventually, um, with usurpations and all. Uh, whereas what happened instead, start, starting from the 5th century, uh, that we call as barbaric invasions was actually something way more pacific than we usually think and if if it was you know problem you know problematic in certain moments was chiefly because of you know the the actors the protagonists of this messing up the situation for an internal struggle of power rather than an actual external threat right and this is exactly what at the end brought to the idea of entire chunks like i don't know big uh, the Gaul or Spain were occupied by the Goths, by the Franks, etc. So, you know what? These guys are better at the moment because they finally can't give us stability, right? It's an easy re read. It's not really like that. This is Gregory of Tours speaking for, for the Merovingians. But it's in, in the longer run, in the longer perspective, it's not really wrong. I mean, there was not a substitution of Romans with Germans, it was not a destruction of the state, it was not a the, this inter an extermination and disintegration. Uh, these things happen very rarely, right? It hap they happened basically in Britain uh, after the Romans left, and not because the Saxons invaded, but be because basically uh, the the British people began to turn against the Roman of British elites and destroyed it. You know, we don't know what happened. It was it was a nightmare, but we just know that all the, the land plots were redrawn, um, and and. So it was literally like a revolution. The other country was Italy, but in the mid, in, in the first half of the 6th century, because of the Gothic War, that incidentally was not the, the Goths invading and destroying Italy, but the Romans invading and destroying um, uh, Gothic Italy held by the Goths themselves and the Roman elites, by the way, on behalf of the same Constantinopolitan government, and because the Roman elites that were pushing for getting rid of the Goths, basically, that instead were making policies to favor more uh at least you know especially during the war the the actual the the, the subjects the free people that that were here it's complicated we, we may all, we made a lot of uh videos about this topic but that is absolutely no thing like a roman or germanic opposition to each other but a, a, a much deeper pol and tran transversal uh intersectional political and social struggle that invested the gods as much as the Romans, in a way. And that did create some problems. An, an example of these problems is also Visigothic Spain. Um, first Visigothic Aquitaine in Spain, then just Spain. Uh, but the executive of the performance... For, so, so, chapeau to the Empire for having managed to re-expand the army, mostly to cope with the most important threat that was the Eastern one. Um, the paucity of the military performance, frankly, is a myth, right? Um, the worst things that happened military-wise, as I repeat it in here, were basically Romans versus Romans, right? After 10 years after Adrianople, that is often quoted like the biggest tragedy, whatever, that the Empire felt because of it, nonsense. Um, we explained that pretty clearly um, in uh, looking at Roman and Visigothic history alike um, in that time. Ten years after this dramatic catastrophe, the Romans could field already a larger army than once they, they lost at Adrianople to fight, you know what, 
another army of Romans. And that tells that Roman resources were still there, and whatever they were used there like that what was not a problem of uh, of external threat but an actual inter a problem of internal competition power struggle etc um and mm, the, mil the the constantinian army especially scored massive results uh, against these much more aggressive ferocious and pressuring um uh, realities that did exist as we were saying before uh Pick the Alamanni and other Germanic confederacies such as the Goths, etc. Constantine's taint, taint them. Um, uh, Julian tainted them. Uh, there were, you know, the, the usual balance of the empire towards this, the central European populations kept on with usually, you know, Roman raids, destructions, and, you know, um, between, you know, before Adrianople, there had been 40 years essentially of, you know, stability on the Nubian frontier from the time Constantine had invaded um, you know had crossed the Danube made a, a freaking mess there and you know deterred enough uh, uh, to for, for these guys not to try it again after that it was the same policy it's the same thing that the Romans started to do since Caesar's times and it did work because guess what you know going out there and showing what this military professional military machine can do exterminating everybody and saying if you dare try it again it will happen again is a pretty good mean to for these guys not, not to do it anymore and it turns out it does work like it should work today where it used um, but and it was a matter of, of actual you know political and strategic vision at that point. That is to say, do you want to do it? Yes. They had the means to, to do it. They did it. Fine. That, that's what it's called, a, you know, a strategical accomplishment. Uh, when you start instead playing with these guys, throwing them one at, at each other, uh, like East and West, you know, uh, arguing about where the Visigoths should be settled and Stilicho trying to, to, to use the Visigoths that he had crushed repeatedly in battle but not wiped out to exactly use them as a political pawn to use in, against the East or the same Western um, Emperor for his own political bits. That You see there that the problem, once again, is not the Goths, right? It's something else, right? It's the internal structure of, of the Empire that, that is messed up in a sense um, and this is pretty obvious even if, if just if you look at the numbers of these invaders like the largest armies were basically 30,000 men which meant in practice also that if you killed these guys uh, literally the entire people was done for because these were all the men that these guys could, could mobili mobilize militarily speaking because they were literally all the um, the the uh, free uh, uh, let's say the able-bodied freemen uh, Yes, slaves did fight as well sometimes, but they were usually ineffective in uh, in practice. They just were relying on the freemen. The rest were, you know, uh, I don't know, uh, 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 a double number of, of, of other, let's say, let's call them, there's not properly separation between civilians and military men um, in these societies, but it's children, women, old um, old men. Uh, they they don't fight, and and uh, that that's the people. So if you even a battle, you lose ten thousand men. It's it's a catastrophe, right? The uh, the, the Visigoths at the time of Majorianus. So we're talking about the last decade of life of the Western Roman Empire could basically surrender. They say, okay, we come back being federati in the full way you want. We, you can't resettle us wherever. Just don't destroy us. Then the, the Vandals came in 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 the middle, and they played it very cleverly. Um, uh, and uh, Geyseric was a freaking, uh, you know, Geyseric, I, I presume, after Clovis and Theodoric is possibly the, the greatest uh, Germanic leader of this time, um, opposed that direction. But once again, you see there, it's, it's a leader sometimes that makes the difference, right? Had the Vandals not put themselves in the way, or had not had a had they not had a, a leader like Geyseric, even when the, the Eastern Roman fleet presented in front of Carthage, they would have surrendered just as the Vandals. And by the time of the Islamic invasions, had ever they existed at that point, because the, also the Roman this Persian frontier would have been different, uh, in the West, at, by that point, there would have been still a, a Roman Empire, right? Uh, a Western Roman Empire. And it, it's, it could go on and on, right? There was nothing deterministic about the the fall of the Roman Empire for literally for literally up to the last decade as we've seen 
With the failure of Majorianus, it was understood now that the, the resources of Italy were exhausted. There was nothing that could be done about that as long as especially as Africa remained into, um, into foreign uh, control. But it's, it's pretty much it. And the fiction also of the imperial election there was, you know, was discontinued, but it could have also gone on uh, in different ways. Um, so there weren't, in this sense, major defeats of the Roman army in this context. There could be, I don't know, losses in, on the eastern frontier, strongholds, wars like that. Uh, the Sassanids were quite obsessed about scoring uh, a major victory on the Romans because they, they, they drew their own ecumenic power uh, ideolo ideology from that as well. But effectively, they were the weaker power. Um, and uh, as we know, we know how it, it, it ended, by the way, but do not underestimate the Sassanids in that regard. We were talking also about the Alamanni, and there the, the Germans could form uh, definitely certain confederacies that were something previously unknown, right? Uh, sometimes uh, they were not talking about peoples on the march properly. We were talking about entire tribes that effectively do not consider themselves to be part of that confederacy. Like, when you read famously enough, like the Franks, the Alamanni, these are standard genetic names. They're just, just like international shout-outs. The, the people that compose them do not think themselves as Alamanni or Franks. They are all different tribes uh, with lineages that are starting also now to emerge um, as, you know, important rulers in, another, in, a, in a society that, you know, up to some century before could have not conceived even the idea of kingship and that here was just very reactionarily, you know, sometimes coming slightly close to something similar to it because uh, the elites were too poor to to essentially um, overwhelm the freemen. But that in this militarized sense where there were new opportunities to see this local Roman weakness because the army might have been, uh, you know, committed somewhere else and these guys also lived pretty much in short term ideas because they were so desperate that you know just a raid one year could say okay doesn't matter what will happen in five years but at the moment we can at least live on and then we will try to negotiate or we will invent something the romans didn't forget easily and as we know they actually didn't give a shit about anybody's uh, existence at that point as long as they uh, that it was useful to them, but this is exactly the, the problem, is that these peoples were often useful, right? Some of the greatest enemies of the Romans sometimes were actually resettled and pacifically, um, you know, integrated. Why? Because they needed them for some reason. Um, this is uh, not uh, just because of the Romans. Like, every empire behaves like that. We were talking about the, the conquest of gold back in the day. Caesar exterminated allies that had not done nothing against him because he needed at some point a certain area to be pacified under control not to you know disturb a balance that that was the overall the broader picture uh, and instead he eventually uh, settled you know or freed certain enemies that he had defeated and had basically betrayed the romans even destroyed some of their legions look at at Trier, the city of Trier was one of the single most important cities in, in, in Roman history. It, it literally takes the name Augusta Treverorum from the Treveri that were part of the ones that had massacred uh, the, the legions of Cotta at, um, in, 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 the, in, in Belgium and that, you know, had, had uh, become basically the, uh, the, the greatest example of Romanization in Gaul, uh, the greatest success. Um, and... Uh, why? Because, once again, if you need them as pawns in that sector to, to play with, you use them like that. And who cares what they did? This, welcome to real-world politics, right? You know, welcome to how literally civilizations, that is, intelligent, developed systems, act in reality. Um, uh, achieving, in, in that sense, uh, intelligently a greater good than what moralistic, uh, absolutistic and moralistic standpoints may, would make you be believe, right? There is absolutely no moral criticism that you can make whatsoever of any of these peoples in practice, um, if not on a civilization value. That is to say, uh, did the Romans exterminate, enslave, and, and rape, etc.? Yes, they did. And and what did every single other people in the world, including the the same ones that were exterminated, enslaved, and raped, do? By the way, among themselves, right? We were not remembering the Bructeri among the Germans before 
just randomly. And I mean, this is literally what the the only thing that these people did by the same fact that they existed. They had no other way of living. They didn't have enough resources locally to stabilize on the shorter run without behaving like that. These peoples were the major uh, slave owners and exporters in, in the same Roman lands, right? Because they were fighting each other con continuously and they exported their own slaves to Rome constantly. Um, after wars of destruction, of the, you know, of, you know, of cleansing, of, of you know, uh, once again, it's it's unspeakable in terms of violence. So if you want to criticize anybody morally from from these differences, just you have probably misunderstood everything about this, about history. I would say in general, because if you don't know that this is the reality of these people, but what the hell have you read in your life about them? Um, uh, but I know there are. There are people where they need to idealize or idolize somebody for you know nonsensical delusions, but uh, that's in fact what we that's not history, and we don't even need to discuss that um, but aside from this, um, there is no major military disaster in this regard. I mean, how many disasters did Rome undergo militarily speaking during the Republic, even the early empire? lots of them right you start counting. The ones of late Roman times, they're not so many, especially they're not so grandiose. I mean, you pick the Battle of Arouse. It was literally the, the greatest bath of Roman blood ever achieved by the Italians. You pick Cannae, that is the, the defeat and the battle. Uh, I mean, the defeat and the victory, of course, depending on how you see. But uh, for the Romans, the defeat, and in general, the battle per excellence in all the history of, of warfare. Um, you pick Carrai, that is also beyond a dozen bright for the, the dramatic, especially, you know, story that, that was developed around it. Uh, we, we, we can talk about the Battle of Teutoburg Forest. I mean, literally, it's plenty of Roman massive defeats. Uh, in, in late Roman times, you don't quite find much of that. And when you find that, pick Adrianople, you see there that, well, ah, you know, Roman quality had decreased where? Like, at Adrianople, literally, what happened is that the Roman command was froze, and they didn't do anything, and they let the finest units being massacred, surrounded, till the end. This is something normally doesn't happen in military history of the time. That is, you know, as soon as you're surrounded, you break and flee. I mean, these were military professionals of the finest order, and they, you know, got massacred till the last man bringing uh, who knows how many others with them um, uh, that were trying to kill them. Uh, and that's literally Adrianople. And as we have seen 10 years later, still in, at the end of the 4th century, the Romans could feel way more military resources than that. Um, what did happen then? Here we're not explaining the settlement of the Germanic peoples in the Roman territory, but it's obvious, as we will see especially in the end, that it was a matter of local acceptability. The same Romans settled these peoples. I mean, the whole Theodosian propaganda was about the fact that the Visigoths now were allies of the Romans, that they were used. That the, after Adrianople, of course, they settled in Trace. They weren't nice people, right? They, they, they kept doing largely what they were used to do. They raided, they, they, they harassed, and so on. But still, you know, they found this modus vivendi with the Romans, and that also entailed the fact that the, the Romans could rely on the gods, and in fact the Visigoths paid a, a, a dramatic blood tribute for Rome, fighting for Rome uh, on, on, on the various Roman frontiers. Right, that uh, after Adrianople, by the way, there is the, the, the only single um, problem uh, in, Roman, in the Roman army that we know of basically uh, disciplinary and we could say fealty problems in term, because of a foreign in, of a massive foreign injection at the moment that is um, the, the gods after Adrianople never surpassed one third of the Roman army in the east in, 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 an, in an operating army but still they, they were, there were some disciplinary problems at that point um, with them um, and that were reabsorbed basically and still you know with these guys fighting in the meanwhile for the same Romans um, I mean pick the sack of Rome by Alaric in 410. I mean, at the mo at that point, the, the Roman emperor had b basically they had not paid the gods, which uh, were technically Roman soldiers at that point. I mean, the Visigoths as a people proper, in the sense of of a kingship, the idea that Alaric was settled as magister militum per etc., is a Roman creation. 
right? These peoples were effectively created politically by the Romans. That there wasn't nothing like a kingship in, in Germanic terms at the time. Alaric was the first and would become very conveniently the model for other Germanic leaders to stress the fact that, if, especially if they were allied with Rome, they could get that, and they would. Um, but they had not been paid. Uh, they went into Italy, where after Stilicho's death was really nobody to defend that. At that point, the Roman emperor had all the Gothic children and women that were lived in the meanwhile in the empire exterminated. Just imagine the thing. I mean, if we're t t talking of, you know, eventually what happened. What does Alaric d do with Rome? It sacks it gently, right? He tried, tries, by the way, at the third one, he, he sees it. Um, and he limits distractions to the minimum. Actually, we know that... Archaeolog archaeologically speaking as well there, there weren't, uh, Rome was exploited of wealth um, it, uh, the, the, the inhabitants were brought to pay but basically there was no destruction, it was uh, remuneration for the due service Alaric was clever, he wanted to maintain power because in the meanwhile all the other Visigothic leaders said what the hell is this guy, you know, he's too powerful we don't like him, we don't like kingship and so on he maintains a good order with the Romans, they exterminated their children and women, right, and goes away and remains a Roman ally. I mean, Alaric dies eventually, but you know, it's still the Visigoths settle in Aquitaine and eventually in Spain as the Roman Federation, the most Romanized of the Germanic peoples, uh, in areas that at that point were devoid of an army and that kept um, supporting the, the Visigothic army at that point. It was virtually a Roman army in terms of actual, in terms, if you speak of, um, of average qualities, I mean, if we speak of leadership, okay, well, we will digress on that, but s s fundamentally they substituted themselves to the army. Uh, that is to say, the Annona that was paid, the Annona was the military uh, supply of, of for, for the army, was locally paid, was, you know, since the time of Diocletian, was basically forced to reinforce this local military service was simply instead of being paid to the Romans, where the local government was paid to, to the Visigoths, now had settled there. Right? And we're not even talking often of actual wealth was grabbed. We're talking about land. Right? Um, so, in practice, what happened here was a simply an overlapping of the systems. Uh, instead of having a Roman army that could also come from who knows where, um, uh, that was stationed there, uh, there was simply now a Germanic army that was you know, politically, you know, maybe not so reliable, uh, that, however, worked with the same local systems, weapon production, supply system, it, they came to be heavily Romanized in that regard. We're talking about the 5th century, though, when things were going downhill. Uh, we're going downhill uh, in terms of actual lack of, of resources, right? The, 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 the rest of the world wasn't faring better. It's not that the Persians or the Germans had more wealth or power of people than, than the Romans had, right? The Romans here were still basically the, the largest power ever that could mobilize more efficiently, more effectively, thanks to, to all this administration that, that wasn't ineffective, right? Uh, the fact it was corrupted, for example, like it, it's typical of any pre-industrial society. I mean, there is not a pre-industrial society where there is not corruption on a regular base, and yes, also on a massive base. Like, literally, pick any single society in pre-industrial times, see the levels of corruption. There is no uh, the, the Roman uh, the Roman system was functioning exactly well for for those standards, um, and surely there were a lot of uh, you know of losses in that regard. But still, this bureaucracy served to maintain a, a, a net of relations of a, of organization, administrative um, capacity that fluid, fluidified a great deal the collection of resources. Uh, in a world that, however, was running out of them, so the decline here is, has not also to do with, uh, I don't know, the, the Romans didn't believe in the old values of, of the which were these values, practically, like compared even just to a German of the time or to a Persian of the time, basically the same, right? Um, it doesn't matter what deity you, you, you prefer, there is, first of all, a universal religious understanding, also uh, a universal moral understanding, and, and the Romans here were also expanding in a sense, uh, in a monotheistic sense, for example, that surely helped a great deal, the cohesion, the compaction of society, um, whereas this, yeah, the Germans in, in their homeland especially weren't that advanced, they, they, they didn't function well, right? The, the peoples that remained there kept being uh, 
less functional than has the, the, compared to the Romans as they were. The ones who settle in Roman territory become kingdoms. Guess why? Because basically they work in the same Roman administration, they get literate, they write in Latin, they issue laws that are basically the, the Theodosian Codex, but, you know, flanked by uh, Germanic norms. And the same goes for the military. You pick a 5th century Roman army, it was a first degree uh, military, right? And they were the best. They were the ones that simply even just for the areas in which they were located were more advanced, right? But if you look at... at contemporary Ger Germanic army, how different was it in practice? Like, if we talk about the Franks, I give you that, you know, those who had come out of, of Germany more recently were something different, we know it, we made a lot of, of videos from that, but even in there, it's not a specific tactic or equipment or whatever that makes the difference, let's say, there is no, um, uh, let's say, it's a matter of h how political and socially, you know, compact you are, I mean, the Merovingians after post-Gallic I mean, yeah, the, the Gallic um, uh, power of the Franks as under the, the monarchy and the, 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 the Romano-Gallic elites, etc. It's obviously, for example, fielding better armies than, I don't know, the Franks as they were still not united and living across the Rhine. Um, the, there was all a process of, of Romanization in that regard, but exactly for this reason, a Gothic army uh, was, by the time it was permanently settled within the empire was surely, you know, well functioning and uh, there is a debate on this because um, essentially of the Justinian reconquest that comes by the 6th century and surely also by a time which theoretically these people should have learned better how to do certain things but there are a bit of prejudices all in all. The Romans did win right, it was relatively easy to get rid of the vandals, of the, of the gods, etc uh, eventually but um, when we look at the 5th century especially, and we look at the face of major settlement of these peoples, it's evident that the reason why they managed to do so, it's simply because the Romans were out of resources. These peoples were pressured by many others coming from, from Central Asia, were pretty also much more um, effective. Relatively, the, the Huns are overrated, definitely. Later on, the Avarns weren't. Uh, but in a sense, it's it's never about the actual military um, technique of fighting. It's always about how politically cohesive they are, right? And um, this is true also for the Germanic peoples, um, generally speaking. Uh, um, the Romans are losing resources, so therefore they have to adapt to to what they have, and therefore they they lower in part their standards, not because not much, be for, for, for example, in, in, in matters of equipment, right? Some say, oh, you know, these guys didn't have the, as much armor as before. Well, pretty much nobody had any more at that point, right? For certain standards, sure. Um, I don't know, if you pick uh, the Germans in Augustian times, they, they barely had any armor, you know, iron, you know, weapon. But the the question there is that by the time... Let's say by the sixth century, where, where at least in the West the migration era is over, um, and the situation had leveled because these two peoples had leveled, right? Um, the, uh, the the they simply the, the the state functioned in 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 the empire in a worse way by that point simply because the the empire had shrunk, right? And when such systems shrunk, it's not that you simply cut a piece of it and the rest keeps living normally, right? There is a, a restriction because literally you become weaker internationally. Uh, you, it doesn't matter how powerful the empire remained in all this, like nobody, even whoever settled in the West, ever thought that they were outside the empire. This is a, 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 norm, as, as a criminal historical mistake. Um, these people kept believing constantly that they were living within the Roman Empire, and nobody ever lost the chance, of course, to be legitimately recognized as ruler, right? Of course, they knew they were ruling in, in, in that place on their own account, but religiously speaking, they all believed fundamentally that the imperial power was shared in a way or another, so that the right of conquest was just a reflection uh, of that. And um, surely, um, here, it, we will have to make more videos about properly the difference between uh, the Roman army and the Germanic armies, especially during the 5th and the 6th centuries, because uh, 
even during the fort, because there were indeed differences, and, and it's not wrong to say that the Roman army maintained the upper hand here, qualitatively speaking. But it's not just quality, right? That's a bit something you want to analyze if you look at the thing just from a tactical point of view. But how many troops can you even field at some point? Um, even if they're well-trained, whatever, but also what's the actual standard also in a province, etc. As you know, the, the same Roman army had undergone the split between the so-called uh, mobile armies, the Comitatenses, and the frontier troops, the Limitane, that sometimes are too drastically separated as um, also in, ter in qualitative terms, but the Limitane sometimes were as well kept and trained as the Comitatenses. Th the point, though, is that that is rarely done when this distinction is... Um, you know, when this um, observation is made, which is indeed true, it, it's wrong to believe that the Limitanus was fundamentally just uh, a militiaman. Uh, they were full, full professional with very good equipment and very good training, motivation, um, often. But my impression is still that most often they were not, meaning that this uh, sedentarization at the end of the day um, should have provided this belt against invasions and uh, stopping them or at least having uh, a capacity of recovering what had been lost when it was typical for example to, to make these guys uh, uh, to let the, the Germans invade um, and to wait literally for them to plunder so that the Roman army could 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 attack them where the worst when they were slow deep in enemy territory seizing uh, exterminating them or resettling them depending on the situation and um, seizing the loot the Germans had made, not to give it back to the populations that had been stripped of it within the same empire, but to pay the same army, right? Which is a vicious uh, logic, if you think about that. But the, the problem is that, that tells you how, ma how many resources the army actually lacked at the moment. And if they had not done that, um, on the shorter run, they would have they would have, they might have caused literally strategical disasters at that point uh, because that army n is needed to to keep literally the empire standing right without deterrence you military deterrence you don't have a rule problem so the problem for all Roman emperors was to maintain um, the army proper right and qualitative issues were were also important because naturally the army is not always a standard pack that you can get all the time. You need reforms, you need uh, re you need funds, you need mm, properly certain, and you need to re reward these people, right? You need to give them a living also because their descendants are the ones now that are socially tied to be the next generation of soldiers. So it's a very complicated business. And in a world where you start being pressured from all sides and this this push is literally making you crumble so that you have to 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 to, ve to give terrain uh, up um, because sometimes I mean you are unavoidably losing uh, ground right much more than the one you actually lose from a physical point of view because you show yourself uh, not capable of defending the territory anymore so it's not really the Roman army as a sort of qualitative system that collapses but rather the the actual numbers of it that shrink after the territorial losses that in part allow you also to settle peoples that are still interested in remaining um, within the empire and that also form some buffer states some obstacle to also the, the major invaders right in areas that by the way are very often not so productive right um, and uh, even when the, the productive ones are seized, it's because you literally can't defend that major chunk simply because you, you once again, you lack enough resources. But in terms of, of actual military quality, there, there is properly uh, not a an active military erosion from the side of enemy um, of enemy onslaught. Right in a in a in a broader picture, right there is just a political permeation that surely passes also through war and that costs etc. But if anything, it wears out also with from the other side, uh, as we were saying before, the the Federati weren't faring that better. Uh, the Huns basically were 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 defeated and you know at least kept at bay and then they 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 collapsed. The empire was still there, 
was still standing and also had the resources, especially in the most productive areas, to, to go on to be the best power around. Um, so, um, literally, history might have taken different a different path, a different turn many times. Right? It would have just taken, and we, we can't say that, uh, I hate those things when it says Adrianople, the beginning of the end. Right, the Roman Empire ended more than one, a millennium later. It's a bit of, of long la- <laughs> a long end, let's say, uh, to say the least. But it is true that, for example, had the Visigoths been crushed at Adrianople, well, the history of the West would have been radically different. That is to say, there is a people less here in the game, and maybe the Romans would have refilled the gap. Who knows? We can't tell. We can't tell whether it was the beginning. Yeah, maybe, maybe things even went better for the Romans. Who knows? Um, paradoxically, but the point is that the Visigoths again could have been destroyed by Stilicho three times on three consecutive occasions. That is, after three consecutive defeats at the hand of the Magister Militum for the West. Right? It wasn't even just the East, right? <laughs> because they simply wanted to push the Visigoths against one another. So at that point, it's a bit difficult to to point out that uh, that was the the beginning of the end, considering how much the Romans played with that, uh, it, it was specifically s- some you know longer run combination that has to do with lots of other aspects that have th- in which that one is most obviously not decisive, as basically no single factor alone uh, is. Um, it. Um, and and we we need not in fact to overestimate the actual capacity i mean the um the actual possibilities of these of 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 an empire like that at the time right such a broad movement of peoples was was a pretty serious thing right the roman world was yes it had some fluvial fluvial frontiers and so on but it was relatively open to these movements Right, it wasn't like you know, there is a massive uh, chain of mountains that cuts you out from other people. No, it, it was fundamentally a constant, um, you know, contact and interaction with these populations that, at the end of the day, came to be integrated in the system, and some of them simply lived on because the empire didn't have enough resources to assimilate them, but still they were living normally at the outskirts of the empire, um, and uh, other times it had simply. Like like the Justinian reconquest, the the possibility of of getting rid of, um, so also the idea that emperors were somewhat inept or incapable is extremely debatable. This has to do also with the nature of the sources that exist at that point from the fourth century, even from the third. We we don't have like a critical, uh, um, let's say, uh, objective. Um, there had never been such a thing like an unbiased um, history because it didn't exist at the time. But the same nature of historiography is, is changed. If we think about the panegyrics, think about the figure of the the courtly scholar. Uh, these people didn't write anymore because they had to to make sense of what happened. They wrote because they had to give a pretty specific ideological idea of the unity of the empire, the stability, that served in, in, a, in a propaganda and a political sense that worked. It was, they were very refined, they were very effective. Um, but in this sense, the, um, the actual mm, information that, that we get um, is, mm, is not quite uh, reliable. Right? We often get, we, about these emperors, we, we often know nothing in in practical terms, like reliably speaking, whether they they were actually capable or not, there was also this this enormous um, bureaucracy that, as we've seen, is all in an enormous empire in the first place that largely self-ruled itself at some levels. And when you go more in depth in the sources, you see that it was already an enormous feat to to keep this thing together because it doesn't matter how the reforms. Um, had been effective back in the day. Uh, still, the, the the broader situation was was problematic, and these mm, pre-industrial systems were unstable on their own. So even the integration of the barbarian element was a, a pretty bright move in, in a in a moment where you know uh, 
slaughtering them would have costed you too much and the broader um you know and, and the advantage offered by settling these people um as a buffer state or um you know or settled scattered as the next you know um labor or fighting force you know would have, would have paid you well so um it's it's not easy to claim a failure of of the roman state at this point of the roman army in the face of these problems um it's rather fairer to say that, that there was a compression in here that was squeezing all these powers against each other and that they had to find a solution that naturally couldn't be just uh, you know pacific but also as we've seen d during the fourth century if we look at, at the actual integrity of the empire well things were going pretty pretty well right and also during the fifth where heavy blows arrived again it was mostly the west suffering from it and in areas that had gone largely depopulated um that couldn't also be reasonably kept at that point given that the most important matters that were happening somewhere else um and that again didn't actually destroy the what didn't didn't um cut out you know the, the roman power per se but it just basically filled the gaps that had remained more open to such infiltration and that mm, the Romans specifically didn't have a priority to, to fill otherwise on their own um, given the, the seriousness of, of the broader situation. I believe this is this is pretty evident and we can't even attribute to the ruling class a capacity or incapacity. This is just a bias that we get from, essentially from the Enlightenment, from, from following uh, historiography that's still so the, the 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 fall of the Roman Empire is itself as something so dramatic and terrible and, and difficult. Whereas you know, what, what, why did it fall in the first place? As if you know, political and social systems had to last forever. We're talking about a huge time of existence of this. So the question should be, why did it fall before? Because it's not normal for an empire to last that as much as, as the Roman one did. It's it's difficultly explainable at some levels. But if you start looking in depth, you you realize even in these moments of crisis is what th th this the resilience of such structure that, that such system that is 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 really impressive and that shows you that the, 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 its bases were very sound and also capable of renewing uh, renewing and adapting. Um, to the situation um, and there is all uh, uh, speaking of the sources as we were saying before also all a moralistic attitude that surely derives from uh, those times historiography as we were saying the elites were particularly upset about the collapse of the system because they, they naturally saw it as the the way of you know we're being cut out from the main center we have to you know stop essentially relying on certain revenues that derive from international interactions, supplies, and so on. These were the same elites that would be so resourceful to eventually adapt and to be basically to hybridize in the, in the Romano-Germanic ones um, uh, at the end of the day, and it made a civilization that transformed themselves from senatorial to episcopal class, etc. We, we often look at these problems um, these issues in uh, late Roman and, and uh, early late antique and, and early medieval medieval times. Uh, so also this idea of the adulation of the flatter of the moral weakness um, of uh, the, the the loss of the great Roman values of one time. Right? It's all it's all rhetoric, right? Just like the the stereotype of the savage barbarian, but also sometimes some of a more positive view for example the romans were definitely um the ones who invented the myth of the good savage and the noble barbarian that is often resumed in today's times for for you know ethno-nationalistic um, propaganda to stress the, the the superiority of these peoples and they don't know that they're, they're actually egoing the roman propaganda on them um and these peoples weren't anything dramatically um, especially in terms of proper of threat per se, right? Um, it was normal for the Romans to settle peoples since the, the dawn of time. I mean, without r settlement of these peoples, the Romans would have not existed as such. There would have not been a Roman uh, 
uh, empire without integration of foreign elements. The Roman army had always been composed since the, the you know the, the earliest times of, of, of the Republic in by more foreign than Roman elements. This is widely known. I mean, look at all the army from the early from 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 the 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 the, the Camillian one onwards. It, it's always been. You know, there were more allies than Romans. Always. This is has nothing to do with the uh, with the with the Roman times. On the contrary, it seems to me that uh, it's quite the opposite. In Roman times, uh, the actual number of Roman ar uh, Roman forces, especially during the fourth century, was naturally superior to, to to foreign ones. Right? Even when these were hired. As individual soldiers eventually settled in, they, you know, participating in the armies, some came back where they came from at the end of their lives. This is witnessed very frequently. Others were actually settled. I mean, we would be so crazy at the end of the day to to live in a place where there's literally nothing, making money in the army, and having the possibility of remaining in a, you know, civilized world, and you know, and to do it. It it happened all the time. Um, and uh, this happened also with entire peoples um, uh, sometimes. Um, so um, the, the idea of thinking that, uh, you know, um, settling the barbarians within the empire, thinking to stabilize them and Romanize them and uh, to ask them for soldiers, um, uh, you know, also loyal and valorous ones who, was was lunacy well doesn't look at the at the actual evidence we have here because if eventually the romans wouldn't be able to do it it's because properly they didn't have many other uh chances i mean the romans weren't happy to you know okay there was somebody knocking at at the danube and, uh, and and saying okay, let me in. Oh yes, uh, come on, I will give you land, etc. You know, I don't want, I don't want to f quote Full Metal Jacket about that, but um, you know, and fine, we're we're done. The, as we know from Ammianus, also for the episode of Visigoths, the, what the Romans, the Roman uh, government was thought immediately when somebody did like that was to seize this people, to enslave it, and to settle it, and to increase it, the profit of the empire. It was often of basically do it, done it all, all, all the time. At uh, that time, things went wrong. Um, and um, the, the question here, though, is that every time, at some point, when these people basically had entered and simply the Romans didn't have enough manpower to stop them uh, because they didn't have resources and these peoples had literally just themselves as those resources, what, what would you do? Right, what would have been the point of bleeding yourself white to exterminate these guys, to make you even weaker and waiting for the next wave that could have taken over even more, when you could simply settle them in Romanized lands and to interfere in their politics and have them, you know, providing soldiers and, yes, still being there, ruling on your behalf, but not controllable. What was the option? Right, as we've seen throughout the 4th century, most of these things were basically exter exterminated, right? There were proper Roman offensive across the the boundaries. From the fifth century, we see something different. You have to read that in the shrinking of local resources in the empire, a huge empire. You don't control the frontier with a with a soldier every every ten meters in here. Here we're talking about thousands and thousands of kilometers that. Uh, you have to cope with in you know, a deterrent fashion with with mobile armies that yes um, are can't be too many um, to to fill the gaps because they would cost r literally too much. The local Limitani can't do something, but they can't. They're not properly a full mobile army. They can't operate um, so consistently under larger invasions. These guys are many. They are hungry because they are pushed by other people. So it's either you know. We break or not? It's it's a, literally a matter of survival. They're warlike peoples, right? So this doesn't actually increase dramatically the military capability because simply the Roman army was more, way more sophisticated and advanced than them. But still, you know, sheer, their sheer numbers sometimes could be enough to break uh, 
locally, you know, the, 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 the frontier guard and, you know, settling in certain areas. Right? And this is literally what happened, especially when the Huns were when the Huns arrived. Without Huns we would still talk about a united Roman Empire. Not because the Huns made it themselves, but because there were a pre- there was a pregressed equilibrium that would easily shift uh um the balance at the local level, right, and making all these people move at the time. It was a big deal. No I mean we we can't stop immigration consistently even today. Uh, you can't imagine what it could be like uh, at the time. Um, so I personally think that this explains a lot uh, in itself. I mean, we, we, we don't need to dramatize something that is evident in front of our eyes, right? There is another point that is made about the military quality, the military comparison of the two systems. They used to say, oh, well, but the Romans were, are you sure that they weren't, like, you know, worse than before? Militarily, militarily speaking, there is no evidence of that. Uh, some will make a point that is to say the, um, uh, the, the, the peoples of the empire were less warlike than they were before. This is absolutely true. But the problem in this picture is not that uh, the Romans were you know, demilitarized um, at a popular level or that there was a renitence to the levy. Right. Um, this existed for a number of reasons that had to do mostly with the people who owned them. It was like the landowners that didn't want to send their labor force for for the army, which is something that was, they were imposed to do since Diocletian time. You know that in, in I don't know in early imperial times, the all Roman army uh, was was made up of volunteers. Right. Sometimes yes, there were forced levies stuff like that. This the Romans still relied on the allies, but demographic resources were were always open, there was always enough people who would join, also because of the military service, the citizenship award and all that stuff. In late Roman times, the the problem is that nor the state nor the privates have a, an interest to to send too many people to war. So also playing on these other external ones is, is a clever move because, you know, for the state, there are stated lands they have to pay taxes. Also other private owned lands have to pay taxes. So the more people, the famous capitalist chancy are literally means, you know, the more heads, the more money, income, right? The same goes for the privates that have their own slaves or and or serfs, let's say, better at this point because things are changing. There are not any more those uh, overwhelming numbers of, of hundreds of thousands of slaves that poured into the Roman world after the, the great conquest of expansions of the earlier times. So they rightfully don't want to send these people away. Um, also, they care about more probably about their health than, than before, etc. But um, to pretend that this world was somewhat softer because it was demilitarized, etc., um, it's fr- very wrong um, from a political, social, military point of view. Uh, the Roman army uh, was... Um, I mean, it's ridiculous to pretend that, I don't know, the average I- I- Italian... Um, uh, levy by the time of Caesar was a, a militarized, warlike uh, individual in in the tribal sense of the world. Maybe by the third century BC, yes, still many Italics were kind of warlike, uh, in a sense, re- eager to take up arms. But it was not much because of their individuality, but by the fact that, that there were you know pre-existing peoples who were well organized and capable of their own military organization it's not about the individuality individuality has nothing to do with with military effectiveness it's the collective thing that matters when you entered the roman army uh you were literally beaten to i mean it's it, even in here it's hard it's very hard to describe what it meant to to be a roman legionnaire uh i mean you basically do not exist anymore as a person Right, you are basically depersonalized. Like, like the military that has to work like that. You are completely stripped of any personal identity, and you're filled with the idea that you're a super soldier that the gods will make win anyway. And you will be acquainted to the most radical forms of psychophysical violence and abuse up to the point you're able to exterminate anybody without any kind of moral uh, remorse. Um, this is exactly what these people are. So um, to to pretend that you know these people came from a demilitarized society, yes. I mean, if you had to mobilize a local lab for an emergency, yes, they were 
crap. But how often did it happen? That's what you needed a professional military with a bureaucracy, etc. And the Roman army was still the, 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 the most effective military machine could be known at the time. Um, and um, in, in this regard, uh, what's the point of a population to be demilitarized? It doesn't make much sense. On the contrary, it favors stability because it's easier to, 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 you know, to control these masses and to rationalize the system of, sor- of sources, of, you know, of drawing resources. And that's the reason why those administrative um, uh, reforms had been carried out in the first place. Um, and um, when we talk about the Germans, well, peoples like the Germans, um, uh, they, they were also halfways. Like if you pick the Persians, they were in part they were civilized like the Romans, especially in the Mesopotamian area. In fact, when they tried to centralize, especially as a rule, but if you take the Iranian plateau, that's basically a feudal society with mountaineers, with the half of war. The Germans were properly warlike peoples in the sense that they were military peoples. That every freeman was meant to be a warrior, otherwise it was rotting somewhere. Um, and, um, and everybody had to stick to that. There was no alternative. And these people lived in in, in, the, in the wilderness, in, in areas where they had literally to, to, to survive on their own with their, their clan to be logistically autonomous, whatever. So they were acquainted to a type of warfare that was not particularly sophisticated, but at this time was growing in terms of um, centralizing capacities of new leaders to, to rise, to rationalize. Um, they were using Roman weaponry, actually. You know, if you pick the uh, the, the Anka and all these things... Uh, you know that they were i mean they were less equipped supplied whatever than the romans but still you know a fully equipped um i don't know alemannic warrior was usually a nobleman at that point would have the same equipment of a roman legionnaire uh, right and not all roman legionnaires were were all standard as you know there was a lot of lighter troops but that also happened not because of an actual qualitative decay but because the collective um, it, combined arms tactics had been emphasized, so uh, it, it actually was a much more effective army at the same time. The Germans relied at that point, especially the Western ones, but also the Eastern, because let's be honest, they were never a f- fully equestrian peoples, um, in spite of the importance of cavalry individually, but not collectively at the end of the day, focused on infantry charges. Literally, uh, a, a Germanic infantry charge was the, the, the strongest infantry charge could be found at the time, right? The Romans proved mul- multiple occasions, like at the Battle of Strasbourg, we made a video of three hours about that, um, and, and Julian's reign, both against the Germans and the Persians, is a pretty effective example of the efficient of the Constantinian Roman machine. Stand their ground against these things, right? And the Germans could do that because simply they, they had a few... Um, supplies they, they weren't dramatically organized in that sense so they had to concentrate everything on the on the immediate effort right so the charge also literally a physical structure was trained to give that much in that single moment and then eventually not to endure so much it was a was the deal right and either they broke by the charge or the, instead the romans relied on a much more you know um couldn't say temporizing but still you know more calibrated um economy of forces given the means they had and in fact the romans played very much on this stereotype so that the idea that the roman soldier was smaller for it, that that is something that was true i mean anthropometrically speaking yes this northern populations were taller but they were just a few inches taller i mean let's see aside that many romans here were literally of Germanic descent, um, in the same, especially in the army, um, but uh, in Celtic and so peoples that you can't basically even distinguish as such from from these people. Um, but properly, the Romans were the ones that invented and stressed the point that there was a moral force opposed to the one of the physical force, right? That it, this is in the this existed also in Germanic mythology, right? The Asin Devani, the idea that the giants are a bunch of brutes, bastards, and that the, there are the finest warriors there instead are smart at the end of the day. I mean, Vodanic fury is, is, is actually wisdom, right? Vodan is not Thor. Um, Vodan is a, a, a freaking old man who is wise and smart, and it's the prototype of the, uh, of the Visots, of the wise, that is the chieftain at the end of the day. Vu is the one who leads soldiers, right? So this is a universal 
value of civilization. So also the Romans had to stress, of course, that there were a civilization that was coping with less developed peoples and that therefore, incidentally, that over-reliance on kind of beefy guys that had just to smash through the charge in front of somebody who could, for example, endure the great um, uh, difficulties of uh, of the weather of the time. It's a, it's a poetic rhetoric it's a pretty realistic one that actually stresses the fact that the Romans had, I don't know, a freaking supply system that could afford them to, to stand more the ground than, than a Germanic army. Um, but it doesn't mean anything in terms of, of physical differences, also because physical differences are literally the most insignificant thing that, that exists in warfare, um, as everybody who is acquainted to military history perfectly realizes, but even just to, you know. Um, and Consequently, when we look at the Germanic development of their military, which did exist, right? The the, the change in three hundred years, four hundred years in Germanic warfare is, is 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 remarkable, right? We I don't think we made a video on, on late Germanic warfare, but uh, uh, made, we made a video on on the early Germanic one. There's a Germanic warfare playlist that explain these things. Uh, it tells you what the deal was there that these peoples now were being simply more stratified, they had elites that could that that grabbed more resources, they could bring best I mean a more structural authoritarian society and and therefore to have you know speaking of uh, decent disciplines maybe too much, but still what is that makes an effective army? Not how courageous you are, but how many kicks in your teeth you have taken when you were abused by your comrades and still managing to 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 remain there as a soldier and to vent that violence on on anybody you would find on a battlefield, and that if you went straight up that you were com completely out. This is this is discipline. It was done at the time, and it, as brutal it was effective. And this existed naturally also in, within Germanic societies, but at a clinic level, right? Whereas the Roman state could give it from the top, so it was also much more crushing in the first place and could afford to discipline, you know armies of you know uh, that that would function well not not just because they were good fighters but because they were good logisticians engineers and stuff and they had the resources the know how the the technology etc the doctrine especially to, to employ it right um uh, all s sources stress that uh you know the most sophisticated military interaction came from more advanced peoples right the germans are no normally pictured as the most as the bravest but also as the le as the least effective, with, with a few exceptions. There, if you read the strategic, and maybe just the Slavs or the, the Berbers are less than them. But the, the 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 first ones are I don't know things like the Avars. Why? Because they were a freaking you know very well pressured people that had needed to discipline itself very quickly. And there are these other guys were at a local level individually, no doubt individually they were dramatically skilled and and, and strength and, and, and strong and so on. But Collectively speaking, if you don't have uh, an actual collective training, you can be strong or courageous as much you like, but you'll be a, a corpse, at, you know, in the first, <laughs> you know, in the first, in the first engagements against uh, an actual professional military machine, because that's what civilization teaches us. And who doesn't want to understand becomes that corpse, and that's how and why we live, you know, decently today, and uh, also because of such things. Uh, and at the time they didn't, uh, but um, I know it's disconcerting, and I really want to make it dark and violent because, frankly, I all these years that I've learned that these things, there is no other way to explain the story. I mean, if you don't actually realize that this is what the world was at the time, that is not a dramatic, um, you know, fictionalization of 20 21st century moral standards you can watch on 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 TV or Netflix and whatever uh, what do we study history for i mean it's ugly i know but it's not my fault <laughs> you know we we should we should exactly know that we we pass through that in order to have what we have and it's horrible it's literally horrible and 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 as we were saying at the beginning it, it makes no sense to criticize either the romans or the germans from that standpoint, because what they were doing at the end of the day was their best, and there is no mechanistic explanation to say why they failed, because 
properly. There wasn't a failure. There was just a pragmatic um, negotiation, so problem solving, and adaptation, right? And even even when failure in the form of a military defeat came, well, that's where you 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 can't witness the resilience of a people. And both the Roman Empire and the Germanic peoples did pretty damn well, as the Persians did, as everybody at the time did, right? Um, all right, so I think we can't stop here. Uh, I don't know how useful this was, but uh, sometimes I see here I'm getting a lot of new subscribers, and um, I pick my topics randomly every day, but of course we repeat ourselves because uh, repetita juvent, first of all, as the Romans themselves said, but secondly, um, it's important to look at things from different perspectives, but still reassert the, 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 the essentials and reflecting on them, rephrasing, rethinking, because it never ends. Right, history should always be about this. Therefore, for now, just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.